Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue in the life of David, where we'll be starting in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1. Now, before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sin, according to 1 John 1, 9. At the same time, we're allowing the Holy Spirit to control us. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and all the things you provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds will be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. David has been anointed as king, has the Holy Spirit upon him, but has not yet sat on the throne as king. That will come in time. Though Saul still occupies the throne, the Lord has rejected him as king. The Holy Spirit has left him, and the prophet Samuel will not see him again. David has entered the scene as Saul's musical therapist and has been made his armor bearer. When called upon, at other times he's back home watching over the sheep. The Israelites are at war with the Philistines. Now we come to the story of David and Goliath. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their camps of troops for battle, and they were gathered at Socho, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Sako and Azka in Ephesh Damin. Now I will show you a map in a moment, but let's first talk about the Philistines. Their first mention is actually in Genesis 21:32, but that's really in reference to their land. But that helps locate to the people who received the book of Genesis where the writer of Genesis, Moses, was referring to. That's along the southern coast of Canaan on the Mediterranean, west of Israel. They actually didn't occupy that land until after Moses, about 1200 B.C. So the writer of Genesis just locating the land for those who are reading Genesis or hearing it read. They had migrated from the area of the Aegean, that's over by Greece, and they were known as the Sea Peoples. Let's look at our map. We haven't seen this one yet. Here we have the land of Israel, the ancient land of Israel. You can see some of the places where the uh, judges were at one time. The land of the Philistines is right here along the coast. And of course, the Great Sea here is actually the Mediterranean Sea as we would call it today. So this is the area of the Philistines and the border of the Israelites. Well, I'll show you that in a moment, but it's right along here about where you see the names Samuel and Othniel. So that's where the Philistines are located, along the coast. They had landed there uh, after the time of Moses and taken over that land. Now they're right next door to the land of Canaan, or we might say within the land of Canaan, and next door to the area of Israel, or the boundaries of Israel. Now let's get another map up here. We're going to get closed in here on the land. All right, so here we go. We see the area of the Philistines to the left this time, right over here. And here's where the battle of Goliath and David will take place. Now, as you can see, if you look closely at the map, you see these triangles. 
the sort of reddish yellow one here on the right is where the Israeli camp is, the Israelite camp, in the Valley of Elah. Now, the Valley of Elah runs, you can see it running from over here all the way through here, and then it goes up north. See, it's from the north uh, east down to the south west. So it's sort of like a slanted T if you look at it. But the battle between David and Goliath is going to be right here by Sako. Here's where the Philistines are encamped over here. So you can just picture them and their tents camped along these two hills. And they're going to have their champion Goliath come out. And this is where Goliath will meet David. So they are gathered at Sako, which belongs to Judah and encamp between Sako and Ezekah in the Ephesh Damin. So Ephesh Damin must be a little closer locale, maybe a particular area of the valley. Let's keep that map in mind for a few moments while we continue through our passage. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. So picture the Israelites lined up on one side and the Philistines on the other. Verse 3, the Philistines were standing on one hill and the Israelites on another hill and the valley between them. Then a champion. Now, this actually means a man in between in the Hebrew language. But the idea is he's the one that's going to stand between the two armies. So we just call him a champion. It's kind of awkward to call him the man in between. So then a champion came out from the camp of the Philistines. His name was Goliath, who was from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Now let's talk about his size for a moment. Six cubits and a span. If you were to hold your arm up, now this is an adult um, ancient person, uh, not a child, but an adult would be about from his elbow to the tip of his finger, his middle finger would be about 18 inches. Now I measure my span here. It says a span is between the spread of your hand, if you were to spread your hand out, it'd be from the tip of the thumb to the tip of the small finger. Adults are around nine inches. So a cubit's around 18, and a span is around nine inches. So by today's measurements on an adult person, on average, it, he'd be about nine foot nine. Now that is huge. I don't think he had a particular disease called giantism, as some people might say, where people actually get really tall. Actually, man, met a man really tall one time. He was eight foot two. That was the height they claimed he was. And uh, he walked into the store where I worked, and he had a big old crown on. He was actually a uh, person who represented a meat company. And he was to draw people in to sell their meat. His name was Henry Height. You can look him up on Google. They have a picture of him. Uh, I remember he had trouble walking. And I remember how tall he was because one of the things I did, I said, I can't believe anybody's that tall. So I measured from the floor of our store up to the top of the door. And when he came in, the door, I think, was around seven foot tall. When he came in, he had to duck. And his whole crown, I think, went above the top of the door. Uh, they actually claim he was only seven six, and he could have been, I'd say, is at least seven six. Now, let's go back to our passage, and I just want you to understand that people do get tall, but today they usually have a little, uh, I'll show you a little disease. <laughs> it's a funny way to put it. But he had some sort of disease called giantism, and they usually have problems in other places. He couldn't walk very well. He kind of flopped his feet. I remember that and had big feet. 
And I remember we went in the back room on a break, and he was back there on a break, and he had to duck so far just to get in our door. It wasn't as tall as our entrance door. So there were real giants, okay, but people did get that high. They did get that tall. Let's go on and continue our story because I want you to see some other incidents where there were giants. Now, the word for giant that's translated is a word that's also translated rafa. So a rafa is sometimes trained, uh, translated, excuse me, a giant. Let me get that in there a little bit better for us. So you'll see the word giant in some translations of your Bible and Rapha in the other. Rapha, that's in the NIV and the NET, the New American Standard, and the ESV use the word giant. So they translate it where these other translations, the NIV and NET, uh, leave the Hebrew, what we call transliteration. If you were to translate it into English-sounding letters, you'd have Rapha. All right, so that's why you have different translations. Some use the Hebrew transliteration is what they call it, Rapha, and others actually translate the word and make it giant. So let's read through some passages because I want you to see there are a number of passages that talk about giants. I'll read through these rather rapidly. This is from the ESV. Now remember, the ESV will use the word giant, so they're translating it. 2 Samuel 2.16 In Ishbi Binab, one of the descendants of the giants, there's your word Rapha, whose spear weighed 300 shekels of bronze and whose armed with a new sword thought to kill David. Uh, perhaps he thought he could kill David. Now this is later on. He's thinking about killing David with his sword. He's a giant. 2118, after this, there was war again with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sebekai, the Hushathite, struck down Soph, who is one of the descendants of the giants. 2 Samuel 2120, and there was again war at Gath, where there was a man of great stature, who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each hand, 24 in number, and he also descended from the giant. So this guy has some other, well, odd things about him. 2122, these four were descended from the giants in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. So Goliath won't be the last giant to die by David's hand or those who served him in the military. So the race of the giants are called the Rafi'im. I'll show you that. Rafi'im, R-A. Let me just see if I can get on the board here. They're called the Rafi'im. We see that in Deuteronomy 2, 10 through 11. I can read that scripture also. I'll read it from the New American Standard, which also translates it giant. Uh, the Imim lived there formerly, a people as great, numerous, and as tall as Anakim. So there's another tribe that's giants. Like the Anakim, they were regarded as Rafi'im. There's your word. That's a, that's a tribe of giants. But the Moabites call them Amim. So that's another name for these giants. Joshua was largely responsible for wiping out many of them before David, listen to Joshua. This is back in Joshua, long before David. At that time, Joshua went and destroyed the Anakites from the hill country, from Hebron, Deber, and Anab, from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua totally destroyed them and their towns. No Anakites were left in Israelite territory, only in Gaza, Gath and Ashdod did any survive. So here we have the giants being talked about by these other tribal names like Anakites. Notice also from Gath, which we just saw is where 
Goliath was from. Well, back to our story, and let's talk about the armament, in other words, the weapons of Goliath. Verse 5, And he had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. Now, what's that? I'll explain it in a moment. And the weight of the coat of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. Now, coat of a mail, let's talk about that. If you've ever watched some of the ancient movies, you'll see them with the Romans and sometimes in the old Greek movies. Well, they have this, it's what it is, is body armor is what we call it today. So I'm just trying to make a curve there for the neck. And they have these, sometimes they'd be uh, like circles, but sometimes they'd be plates and they'd lay on each other. Okay, kind of like shingles on the top of a house. So you have these plates laying on each other. So the whole thing would be like this, okay? That's a coat of mail. Overlapping plates or rings. Okay, let's make the other side rings. So they have these rings. I've seen movies with those also. I notice some of those things sometime. So that's a coat of mail. Now it says it weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. Now you don't know how much a shekel of bronze, but we do have archeologists and scholars who study these things and their estimate, you'll read different scholars, it'll range from 126 to about 220 pounds. That's a lot of weight. But remember, these guys were big. Now, a shekel is 11 grams, if you're into this the kind of math yet. Multiply by 5,000, it comes out to 122 pounds. So he has this huge coat, this body armor, verse 6. And he had bronze armor on his legs, a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The armor on his legs was called greaves, G-R-E-A-V-E-S. So he had like, well, if you ever seen a catcher in a football game, or excuse me, in a baseball game, he'll have these uh, shin guards uh, that covers his uh, knees and his shins. That's kind of like what this was. Verse 7, let's talk about his spear. The shaft of his spear, now this is the what we call the wood part, was like a weaver's beam. And the head of the spear weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer was walking before him. A weaver's beam is a big block of wood that they use when they're uh, uh, doing, uh, making uh, material. Uh, you can look it up on the internet if you want, but it's a big piece of wood. The head of the spear, which would be, of course, what we'd call the blade, was shaped like a flame. In fact, it was named after the word that means flame. 600 shekels, 15 to 16 pounds. Now, I used to throw the shot put when I was in junior high, and I can tell you that is a heavy piece of of metal. If you ever have anybody in the house that works out with weights, just go hold 15 and 16 pounds of weight in your hand and think about how far you could throw that. Not very far. Probably hardly at all. Verse 8. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. So Goliath, Goliath is shouting out to challenge the entire Israelite army. He sounds like he's superior. Am I not a Philistine and you're just servants or slaves of Saul? That's what the word means, slaves. Choose the man from yourselves and let him come down. So come down from the hill. He'll fight one-on-one -on -one battle to settle the matter. 
He'll represent the Philistines. Israelites, the Israelites need to send someone down to represent the Israelites. Verse 9. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. Now, let me explain this a little bit further. What he's saying is, if I win, then I'm gonna, then my army is going to win the battle also, and you're going to serve us. If your man wins, then you're going to win the battle also, and we'll serve you. Verse 10. And the Philistine said, I defy the army of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight each other. Now the word defy, if you don't know what that means, it has the idea of taunting or insulting. So he's insulting them. That's what's going on. Now he's defying the troops of Israel. When David hears this, he's going to see it as something much different. The challenge is clear. One-on-one -on -one combat between any Israelite who will dare fight him there on the floor of the valley of Elah. Now, what is Saul and his army doing when they hear this taunt? Listen to verse 11. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Well, dismayed is probably a hard word, but it means they're afraid. They're confused. They don't know what to do. There was not a good choice for them. No one could defeat this big, giant champion. No one had been facing up to him. This has been going on for a while now. So their choice is, do they surrender and become their slaves or send someone out to certain death and become the slaves anyway? It's not clear why they did not send the entire army up against the Philistines. But here's what I understand. The champion of each side also represented their God. So they thought whichever champion won, then the winner's God was more powerful than the other. And they would lose the battle because this was a good sign that their God is more powerful than the other. But no one would step out for Israel. But you see, they had an unknown ace in the hole. That is, Israel did a shepherd, a musician, but also a capable warrior. But most of all, the Lord was with him. Now, we should assume that Goliath also had great strength. I mean, just to carry around all that heavy armor and weapon, large weapons. And one strike with his weapon would mean sure death. To most anyone that was normal in size. Did you also notice there was no mention of a sword with Goliath? But he had one, because later David will take it from him. Verses 12 through 15 gives a review of David, his family, and his relation and age to his brothers before he comes on the scene. We'll read through this rather rapidly. Verse 12. Now David was the son of Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was old among men. In other words, this tells us that by now Jesse is an older man. All right, so David, remember earlier he was with the sheep. He's probably, uh, I'm going to say he's around... 18, 19, it's hard to say for sure. He wasn't a little kid, though. I don't think so. The language, does, language doesn't indicate that. 
He is called a young man. Now, the three oldest sons of Jesse. Let's go to verse 13. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle. And the names of the three sons who were who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. Verse 14 and 15. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul. So, the three oldest brothers of David are already out there in the battle lines. But David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So David had been going back and forth. But apparently this is the first time he really is going to hear Goliath out there. Because Goliath would go back and forth. It looks like he came in the morning and the evening. And then in between they just probably stared at each other, watched each other. That is the two different, that is the two different armies did. Now you might think, well, wait a minute. Isn't David the armor bearer? Well, remember what I said? He's only armor bearer when he's called upon. So apparently Saul had other armor bearers. But he wasn't there this, this time. And besides, Saul's not going to go out there in front of that giant. David was still responsible to take care of the sheep. So he's going back and forth. He's taking care, he's taking care of his brothers by bringing them food, taking care of the sheep. And then when called upon as an armor bearer, he'd be with Saul. But like I said, there's probably at least two or three, maybe several armor bearers for Saul. Verse 16, for 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. 40 days, that's over a month, see? Verse 17 describes how David got to the front lines to confront David. So we've learned about David again. We see the battle situation set up. Goliath out there taunting Israel, calling for a challenge, someone to come out and fight him. Now we go back to Jesse and David. And Jesse said to David his son, Take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. So, we're assuming if Jesse is still nearby in Bethlehem or if they're camp followers, but you see Jesse would have to have all this food with him, so I expect Jesse was closer to home. But remember, he had other sons. Maybe they were running food up there. We don't know. At any rate, David is assigned by his father to take some food out to his brothers, and this is where they got their supplies. He takes some roasted grain, that's parched grain, that's what the pa passage says. This is kind of like cereal in those days. I don't think they put milk on it, but it's kind of like cereal. It was a common food. It could be made of corn or wheat or barley. It was eaten with bread and vinegar, that is sour wine, and that was basically a meal. He's told to carry them quickly, so David had to get up and get going. Maybe they're running a little bit late. So he takes some food to his brothers. Now, understand, <clears throat> understand what's going on here. God is moving David to go at this time. Remember, this has been going on for 40 days. To take the food to his brothers. But this time, he's going to hear the giant. Jesse gives David a small list of things to do. He said, also take these ten portions of cheeses to their commanding officer. See if your brothers are well and bring some token of assurance from them. So here's three other things you're supposed to do. He's supposed to take the food, first of all, we saw in verse 17. All right, <clears throat> verse 17 again. Let me go back to that. And Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. So he's going to take all this food to his brothers. He's also going to take, as I just read, this cheese to the commanding officer. That would be the commander who was in charge of their group of soldiers. 
10 portions of cheese. Take it to the officer. He could enjoy the food. Maybe he thought maybe that would make uh, the commander uh, take care of his men better. So David was to give this gift of 10 portions of cheese to the commander. Another thing we can see here, the soldiers were responsible to get their own food. So apparently they had family members send them out. <clears throat> Perhaps they took a bunch with them in the same, at the first time and they go out with them and then the uh, supply people would take care of it until it was time to eat. The second thing they were supposed to do is to see if your brothers are well. In other words, check on them. The word for well here is interesting. It's the word shalom, a very common Hebrew word. It's used in greetings, shalom. Uh, it means completeness, welfare, peace. And we hear them even use it today in Israel, and Hebrew uh, speakers will use the word shalom for hello. The third thing, he was supposed to take back a token of assurance. Now, this probably means one or two things some sign that the brothers are okay, or it was kind of like a receipt for having taken the supplies he was responsible for his own sons to the supply person. Now, in the army, they call him the quartermaster, okay, in the United States Army. Now, in our day, we might call him the supply. Just take him to the supply. We didn't use the use a title of somebody unless there's a sergeant there. So take it to the supply sergeant. That's when I was in the service. So he's supposed to get some sort of token and assurance. So he's taking food to the brothers. He's taking some special gift food for the commanding officer. He's to check to see if the brothers are well and then bring back a token of assurance. Verse 19 gives us the location of the battlefield. So I'm going to put the map back up there, which we're a little familiar with by now. Okay. We get the map. Verse 19. I'm going to just read this to you. Now Saul and they and all the men, that would be the sons, of Jesse, were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Now we know that. Verse 20, And David rose in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse had instructed him. And he came to the encampment of the as the army was going out to the battle line shouting the battle cry. Now, now that you've looked at the map, let me get those scriptures up there for you so you can look at them. In fact, I'll put that, those up as well as the next one. David gets there as the troops are moving out to the battle line. That's what it tells us. Verse 21. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle army against army. So now they're facing each other on each side of the valley, probably shouting their own battle cries. Would this be the day someone would take up the challenge from Goliath? And verse 22, David enters the scene. David left the supplies in charge of the keeper of the supplies, remember I said the quartermaster, and ran to the ranks and asked for his brothers to check on their welfare. Now he runs up there to check on his brothers right quick so he can report back to his father. Okay, verse 23. As he talked with them, behold the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before, and David heard him. Notice, David heard him. Verse 24. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him 
and were afraid. So they just, you can just see them all back away. All, some of them might get further than that. They're so scared. The word for fled means to flee. They ran. They retreated. This is not an orderly retreat. They're getting back away from him. They don't want any part of this guy. One wonders what else they thought when they saw him. Are there more giant warriors like this? Many more? We wouldn't stand a chance. You remember when the Israelites, if you know the story, when they spied, sent the spies out in the land, we see this in Numbers 13, that 10 of them came back and reported, we can't go in there, they got giants. But not Joshua and Caleb. They were ready to go. So we see something here, what fear does. Fear short circuits one's thinking. You know what short circuit means, right? When something in the electrical line breaks, it short circuits. And the reactions of fear is usually fight or flee. In our passage, they flee. They were afraid. So this tells us about the thinking of the soldiers of Israel. They took the insults, the defiance from this Philistine, but they were too afraid to do anything. Verse 25 gives us what was known among the ranks. Verse 25. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who keeps coming out? For he has come up to defy Israel. The king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and give to him his daughter. And he will make his father's house free in Israel. Now this takes some explaining. So this is the word among the troops. This is what they know. This giant is defying Israel, and if someone will go out and face him and kill him, then his reward is great riches from the king, including his daughter. He is married into the family through the daughter. And the last line, and he will make his father's house free in Israel. That means he probably not only does not have to pay any kind of taxes, but maybe he doesn't have to volunteer, or actually not volunteer, but give over any family members to work for the king. So that would be quite a award, a reward, I should say. Verse 26. And David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? See, they didn't know. He didn't know what the reward would be. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Let's look at this verse in two parts. It's an important verse. First part, and David said to the man who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills, kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? David's answer to what would be done for him we just saw in the previous verse. The troops know the answer, but David hasn't heard it yet. He's trying to figure out exactly what's going on. Here's his reason. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is this guy that he should defy the armies of the living God? David calls him, calls him an uncircumcised Philistine. He's not even the same class as people, as the people of Israel. In other words, he's not one of God's people. He's not marked with circumcision. He's not one of the chosen people, the people of God. He is not at all at the advantage Israel has. We're God's people. He speaks against the armies of the living God. You notice that? He defies the armies of the living God. So, 
so David puts the Philistine in his place and reminds everyone what he's doing and that they are the armies of the living God. Let's talk about the two gods on each side. The God of the Philistines. Let's write this up here. His name is Dagon. His name, I think, comes from fish, the word fish. Some think he's some sort of fish god, and he may be because, remember, they were sea peoples originally. And, of course, we have the Israelites on the other side. We have the Lord God, the Lord God, Elohim, excuse me, Yahweh Elohim in the Hebrew, the Lord God. So they're champions representing Dagon. The Israelites representative will represent the Lord God. This is what David brings out, and he's living. Dagon's just a statue, or he may have demons behind him, but in itself he doesn't really exist. He may be made out of wood or stone or some sort of rare rock or precious stone. But notice how David's thinking is much different than theirs. He's different from the army of the Philistines, obviously, but also the man of the army of Israel. He's not going to put up with this. But what makes different David different? He knows the Lord. The Lord is with him, and he knows that giant hasn't got a chance against the God of Israel. And what is foreign to David's mind is why someone from Israel does not go out and kill this man. You see, fear can be contagious. And it appears that every soldier, including Saul, was afraid of him. Do you remember that God does not concern himself with outside appearances? He looks at the heart of Israel's best and bravest warrior was not even in the battle ranks. He just comes up to visit. So he is there now. So David has asked this question why no one does anything about this uncircumcised Philistine. Verse 27. And the soldiers answered him in the same words, saying, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. So they review for David what's been said and what the reward is. He'll be made wealthy, receive the king's daughter for a wife, and all the privileges of being in the royal family. With that said, in comes David's oldest brother, Eliab. He gets into the conversation, which is in verse 28, and we'll continue the story and see the battle next time. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. Thank you for this wonderful account of David, who stands for you, whose thinking is so different from others, because you are with him. Lord, help us all realize that you are with us as your people. Save through the work of your son. Challenge us with the truths we learn from this story. In Jesus' name, amen.